coming up on this edition of the Penn State Blitz. So much to get to. A Tommy Stevens update. We'll take a look at Penn State's running back picture and depth chart. We'll examine the Penn State wideouts who may be joining K.J. Hamler in the starting rotation. And as always, we close with the Penn State mailbag. Greg, right? Greg yes. Pickle? All right, let's talk about Penn State football, Greg. We've got to talk about Tommy Stevens. It's been a whole week since we talked about him. Yep. little update. He's taking some visits this week. Hopefully, he's probably getting closer to a decision on his 2019 future. And as you look at it, uh, I think he had a couple of SEC visits. Uh, Miami of Ohio, I think, was on his calendar, and also a Big Ten school. Yeah, so depending on when you're watching this, he may have seen Kentucky already. He may have seen Mississippi State already. Yeah. He definitely already saw Illinois and Miami of Ohio. Uh, Illinois looked like a logical landing spot. They don't really have a starting quarterback. The presumed starter is in the transfer portal, just as Tommy Stevens is. <laughs> but they accepted a uh, graduate transfer from former USC quarterback Matt Fink on Tuesday. <laughs> so I think that I, I can't envision why Lovey Smith would want to take two graduate yeah. transfer quarterbacks. So. To me, uh, it looks like Illinois is out. I mean, Mississippi State, they have two pretty darn good guys, including a former Penn yeah. State target, Garrett Schrader, who enrolled early to fight for that job. At Kentucky, I mean, I don't think you were impressed by Terry Wilson in the, in the Citrus Bowl, but um, he is the starter there, and they have some other guys uh, on campus, albeit one that have never played before. So I think it comes down to Miami or Kentucky at this point, and uh, we'll see what he decides to do unless somebody else comes into the hole. We know he's not coming back to Penn State. That's right. We know that's not his name, not even on the roster. Not even on the By the way, you never really said goodbye to the Penn State fans. Not yet. Isn't that weird? In you think time. it's coming? In time. Is that what you've heard? It's, I, I think it, in time, Tommy Stevens will say goodbye to okay. the Penn State fans. All right, let's talk about some Penn State Nittany Lions that are on the roster. Let's do it. The running backs. As we came out of spring, I think you remember James Franklin telling us that two running backs had separated themselves from the pack. Not that that's surprising. Uh, Ricky Slade, obviously, the second-year player uh, who played as a true freshman, backed up Miles Sanders, five-star recruit, showed some, showed some good things last year. And Journey Brown was, was one of the most improved players, I think, coming out of spring. And he looks like he has kind of a hold on the number two uh, position. But what about, what about Noah Kane, number one? Because he did show some good things in the blue-white game. And I do think they're going to look at Devin Ford in August because yeah. – it was only four years ago that Saquon Barkley burst onto the scene and pretty much, you know, it was all over for Akeel Lynch and Nick Scott after that with, right. with a couple with a real strong showing in August. How do you, do you think there's a chance they could play four running backs? I, I think it'd be hard to do, but in the four, and you could play four in the sense of one of those guys that's a freshman only plays in four games and doesn't yeah. burn his retro. Maybe both of them do. If Ricky Slade and Journey Browns take over, uh, is the leady running back. I think you have to eventually go with one guy who's going to be your hammer late in the game and when you need yards. And whether that's Slate or Brown, I just don't know at this point. Yeah. Maybe it's Kane, too. I mean, you don't want to forget about Devin Ford, right. but it's hard to ignore the head start the other three guys have over him. But you're right. I mean, Saquon Barkley came in that year and had no head start and didn't need one by uh, the time Buffalo rolled around. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Don't forget about Devin Ford. One guy we're getting a lot of questions about, and maybe we'll talk about it in the mailbag, but C.J. Holmes, Notre Dame transfer. He had to sit out last year. Will he have a role? I, well, I don't know where he fits in. He's played a little bit of receiver. Maybe yeah. he slides over to Jared Parker's room, but in the running back uh, room, it's a pretty darn crowded with talented guys already. Telltale sign is he wasn't really mentioned by either James Franklin or any of the assistants, right. so that, that tells me that they have they feel pretty good about their top three, and I do, I do think Devin Ford could complicate matters. I remember... In 2012, uh, their, their depth chart at running back, it started with Bill Belton. He got hurt. I think Curtis Dukes was up there. I think he got hurt. Derek Day got hurt. Yep. They used uh, they used Michael Zordich as a tailback one game. And they finally settled on Zach Zwinak, and he mm -hmm. had a 1,000-yard season. But yeah. he, wasn't even, he wasn't even on the radar. So no. I do think that's uh, there is a chance that if Devin Ford is as good as people think he is, if he gets his chance, he, he could really force the issue and maybe, uh, maybe uh, shoot up the depth chart sooner rather than later. Agreed. Okay, the wideouts. Now, that's another, I think, fascinating position. Uh, the, wideout, the wideout room wasn't great last year. They mm -hmm. just, a lot of drops, not a lot of production. Uh, Juwan Johnson's now in Oregon. He yep. was supposed to be the star last year, and he, he was hurt. He was a little inconsistent. 
DeAndre Tompkins runs four three, but he can't hold on to the ball. Right. Um, so yeah, you know, he's he's moved on, graduated. KJ Hamler was the best wideout that they had, but by the end of the season, Greg, I think a lot of people were pretty confident that Jahan Dotson, mm-hmm. uh, with what he showed over the final month, yeah. would be a guy that is a, is a likely starter. But I think what everyone wants to know about is maybe who is that third guy? Can are they ready to hand the job to Justin Shorter, or do you think there's some other wideouts that maybe? Uh, could could make yeah, some noise. I mean, I think he has to earn it, but you know, much like Tommy Stevens was number one going into spring right. practice, and Sean Clifford was number two. Obviously, the Penn State wouldn't be better off if it works out this way at receiver too. But I think Justin Jordan is probably that number one guy. Daniel George is number two. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to wonder if the transfer, the grad transfers that are expected, George Campbell and Weston Carr, how do they work their way in? Carr, you know, is not just not really, you know, he's not a big, big guy, but he's not small either. George is definitely more of a Juwan Johnson, Daniel George, Justin Shorter type. Mm-hmm. So I think those two guys are interesting, but Shorter was a former five-star recruit, the number one receiver in the country, so on and so forth. We could list his accolades in high school uh, for much of this video. It's time for him to step up. I know he was dinged up last year. I know he's maybe dinged up a little bit during summer camp. He needs to yeah. get, I'm sorry, spring practice. He needs to get healthy for summer camp. He does. He's probably going to be your third starter for uh, Jared Parker. You know, I'm curious to see if James Franklin's going to mention anything about his weight. You know, yeah. I guess because he the whole cheeseburger of, comment. Yeah, he's 232, and James made it sound like uh, it, it was it was a struggle to keep him there, and that he was a cheeseburger mm-hmm. away from 250. I don't think Justin appreciated that. We'll see if it motivates him. One other guy I just want to bring up. Uh, as we look to August, is John Dunmore. Yeah, uh, he's he's a fast wideout. We actually had a chance to get a see him practice mm-hmm. at the Under Armour uh, leading up to the Under Armour All American game. He's a he's really skinny. Yeah, he's like 6'2", 170 pounds, but he can run. Fluid guy. Any chance? You know, we weren't really talking about Jahan Dotson at right. this time last year. Is there any chance maybe he could be a guy that would factor in? And we can't forget about. Dan Chisano. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I think there's a place for him. I think TJ uh, TJ Jones is the other receiver they signed late. Perhaps he factors into the mix. John Dunmore, he looked really good when we saw him yeah. in Florida, but he was thin. I mean, I, I think putting weight on will have to be his first priority. And with so many guys ready to go in this receiver's room, I just don't know if you put him on the field right away over the emphasis on adding weight for him. And maybe that slows him down a little bit this mm-hmm. fall but it gets him ready to play next season. So we'll see. He could be a guy who certainly see play maybe early in the non-conference slate, get his feet wet a little bit at, at the college football yeah. level, but not play more than those four games. I think T.J. Jones is interesting, too. Good late get, and has a good relationship with Jared Parker. All right. You know what time it is. It is. It's time for the Penn State football mailbag. It Although, is. usually you, you manage to get a non-football question in, in there, but I don't I don't know what you have up your sleeve. Let's 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 get to it. Yeah, uh, we'll start with football since that is the point of our little video series here. Uh, you know, Bob, one of the things that that you wrote about recently, and we kind of talked about a little bit during this video, is the running back pitcher. Yeah, and I think the question a lot of people have is, uh, can they play two at one time, or will it make sense to play two at one time and take you know a receiver off the field? To maybe keep defenses at bay. Is that something you've seen? Uh, it's something if you see it as something Ricky Ronnie could implement in this offense pretty flawlessly. I think it's more likely that they might put two tight ends on the field, yeah. two running backs. I, I think it's a one running back offense. Now I know that essentially Trace McSorley, when he was playing, you almost had to honor him as as a two back. You know what I mean? It was almost a two back offense when he mm-hmm. he was quarterback. And and I don't know that Sean Clifford is quite that guy, but I think that they, you know, they they the spring they they kind of tweak their offense a little bit to see what Sean could do, and I think they feel good about him back there with his mobility. He's actually gotten a lot bigger, mm-hmm. up to almost 220 pounds. Um, but, yeah, it, it is going to be a little fascinating to see if there'll be a two-back set. I don't think there will be. I'm also curious. I want to see them uh, use those guys in the passing game a little bit more, mm-hmm. and they talked about doing that in spring, I think, last year. Um, they got caught in a bind because uh, once you got past Miles, they didn't really have a lot of options that they really could use that they liked and they trusted, and they, they didn't want to run the risk of kind of burning Miles out. So right. they kind of, to preserve him as, a, as you know, a, a running option, they didn't really throw it to him, and they tried to manage his workload. I think that this year they're going to have to, especially with the way that everyone was dropping passes in the wideout room, I think that the running backs, this is their most talented, you know, depth chart for running backs. They've had more talented individual runners at Penn State, but from maybe one through four, I think this is their most talented running back run. All right, question two of three. I believe you wrote about the safeties last week, if I'm not mistaken. I did. And your thoughts. Thank you for noticing. Sure thing. Yeah. And your thoughts on Jaquan Brisker 
Yeah. What he can bring to the secondary. And will Brent Pry and Tim Banks elect to play three safeties? Like, are, uh, like James Franklin is promoting along the offensive line, like yeah. play three guards? Yeah. Or will Lamont Wade and or Jaquan Brisker win that job next year? Taylor? Well, the one thing I would say about the safeties, Greg, is it looks like the guys that they like the most, Sutherland, Lamont Wade, maybe Jaquan Brisker, and even Garrett Taylor, they all seem to be box safeties. Mm-hmm. I don't know that they have a, a really a true center field safety. And I think that was what kind of Nick Scott did for them last year. So I just wonder how they're going to use the safeties or are they going to kind of – who would be the guy that would be in the center? I think it would probably have to be Garrett Taylor, right. former corner. So he's got some covered skills. I'm wondering if maybe they would tweak that and move him maybe more into the center field and use those guys – you know, closer to the line of scrimmage. Uh, I know a lot of people like Jaquan Brisker, mm-hmm. and he's certainly a big safety. Uh, but I am curious. I, I, it kind of surprised me a little that it looked like Lamont Wade was kind of the, the coach's choice coming out of spring mm-hmm. uh, over Sutherland. Now, that could change, but for a, you figure he went into the transfer portal maybe because he saw the writing on the wall and he wasn't right. happy, but he changed his mind. And it looks like uh, he was rewarded for it because they did give him a long look. And I don't know what you think, but it, it, it sounds to me like they're really going to play him a lot. It's hard to read it any other way. I mean, you could I, you know, honestly, you could look at it as, well, they kept they put him in the starting spot coming out of spring to appease him after he's going to transfer. I don't think that's the case, though. Right. I think he really is taking a step forward. And unless Brisker knocks, them off, knocks their socks off in summer camp, I think the job probably is. All right, last one. I think you needed some time to watch the replay. I certainly did as well after Saturday. It was the call right in the Kentucky Derby Bob to take maximum security down, put up Country Horse, or Country House rather, who is now not running in the Preakness. No Triple Crown winner this year. Yeah, that was just bizarro world. Mm-hmm. And the long delay and, you know, I, I, I mean, this is a horse racing question, but it, clearly the best horse was maximum security. Right. Did he commit a foul by the letter of the law? I mean, I, I think that he did. Just don't know. It's as a lot of people have brought up, including Nick Horvath in a, in a column by our David Jones. You know, they put a they put the two, the horse up that one the horse they put up Country House wasn't fouled. Right. So it's just weird, you know. And also there was a lot. There, the maximum security, I think, went off as the post-time favorite. So yes. that was a big money swing for mm-hmm. old Churchill Downs. It was. Uh, I just think that I think that Nick and uh, Dick Girardi made some good points. When you have a 19 or 20 horse field, you have to allow for some some stuff that not that is going to happen because right. there's just not enough room for the race horses when they come they come off the turn. I don't. I think that I think that it was a foul, but I don't. I think if had, they had not taken him down, I don't think they would be. A lot of outrage over it, but it seems like it's it's very divided. It he, there's no gray area. Either they believe it that he should have been taken down, or that he shouldn't have. No one's on the no one's on the fence. So, right. it's it's a shame though that uh, the Preakness is is. I don't think that Country House is going to be able to win the Preakness. Well, he's not running in it, so so I was right then. <laughs> so Country House is not going to be able to win the Preakness, and Maximum Security is not. He's not correct. He's not going to enter it. So, what are we talking about? Game winner. Back to the Derby, pre-Derby video, Bob. We can just replay that skit. First DQ in Derby history, and I didn't have a piece of it, but I feel, for all those people who had maximum security, I feel pretty bad. All right, that's it for this edition of the Penn State Blitz and the Penn State Horse Racing Blitz this week. And I, I have a funny feeling we're going to be talking about Tommy Stevens next week. Doesn't it feel like we're getting close it to... It is a weekly conversation. I think we're getting close to decision day for old Tommy Stevens. Yes. So we'll see what happens.